Good afternoon. The informational briefing by the Committee on Housing, Utilities, Public Safety, and Homeland Security is now resuming with the informational hearing with Department of Corrections at 3.53 p.m. I'd like to thank um, Director Lamarena and also recognize the following that are here today. Colonel Borja, uh, Isaac Mantanania, Christopher Donat, Anthony Guerrero, Tony Lamarena, Therese Tayama, Kate Baltazar, Anton Ogin, and Patricia Taimiglo. Thank you for being here today. The informational briefing, we'd like to cover some of the shortfalls that you foresee projected and some of the uh, realignment plans that you have in place. And so, Director, I'll just, uh, I'll allow you to go ahead and give your testimony. Thank you, Senator. My name is Tony Lamarena. I'm the Director of the Department of Corrections. Um, as you're all aware, uh, the, de the Department of Corrections is a city in itself. Um, we have over 700 individuals that we care for. <clears throat> Unlike uh, other cities, we, we actually have to make sure that these individuals are provided health care, meals, and all the necessary necessities, uh, unlike any other cities that are operated. Uh, we provide medical care, uh, psychological care. We also uh, have rehabilitation programs. And so um, we, we try to operate holistically and not look upon ourselves as just strictly uh, as an area of incarceration. Um, with me today are the various subject matter experts uh, that I work with on a daily basis to ensure that we provide the necessary care and safety for, for our detainees and inmates. The culture of, of uh, the criminals today, as we see it, even in the newspaper, we're, we're seeing individuals who are being arrested for drugs on, on a routine traffic stop. A guy runs a red light, police do a check, and, and they find drugs on him. So we're, we're seeing the, the drug epidemic growing much faster and greater here in the island. And in return, we at DOC eventually inherit that issue. As a result of that, um, on a daily basis, uh, thank, thanks to the Mandania Task Force that we work very closely with, uh, fill our, our, our prison uh, to max capacity to the point where uh, we don't have sufficient manpower and sufficient capacity to at times house these individuals. Since January of last year, we have lost 40 officers. 40 officers through retirement, through terminations, and through mostly resignations. It's, it's not easy being a correctional officer. Uh, a corrections officer, from the minute they clock in, they deal with convicted criminals on a daily basis through the entire shift. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough job. And, and uh, you know, every time I walk the line and I talk to the officers, I admire them for the work that they do. Uh, and, and with over 700 individuals currently at the Department of Corrections, which was intentionally originally built for 200 individuals, since then, new buildings have been built, but some of those buildings weren't even designed for, for, for incarceration. Uh, we have our education room, which is now post-17, which houses about 70 individuals, 70 detainees. Uh, and again, because it wasn't designed as a housing unit, uh, there are blind spots, there are areas where you know, we have to ensure the safety, not only of our officers, but also for those who are housed there. Recently, we just finished um, renovating post-17. We've installed uh, locking, mechanis locking mechanisms, uh, installed cameras, both interior and exterior. We're currently uh, working on doing post-7. And all this was as a result of the hard work of the men and women of the Department of Corrections, the Attorney General's Office, the Lieutenant Governor's Office, GMH, uh, 
the Department of Public Works, the University of Guam, uh, to finally lift the consent decree that was 26 years old. As a result of that, uh, GMH now operates our clinic. We provide the best care possible to all of our inmates and detainees. Uh, and we're looking at renovating three, as a matter of fact, one is already completed, two additional posts. Uh, but the reality is, is the, our facility is an aging facility and, and we need to continually uh, upgrade the other posts as well. Uh, Larry Lorenzo, who's here, who works uh, on maintaining uh, our facility along with JJ Mendo, uh, on a daily basis, we're on repair mode. Uh, something's breaking down and, and something needs fixing. So, you know, these are the things that we have to deal with on a daily basis. But I, I congratulate our corrections officers and all our civilian staff. Senators, we have 11 civilian staff. And most of those civilian staff, I have three in my admin office. We have five in social work and uh, one in forensic. And, and these individuals on a daily basis, um, you know, put, put all that they have into serving those individuals within DOC. Um, I know in the last uh, few weeks it was quite controversial of having uh, the Haganya precinct being detailed down to the Department of Corrections to assist us, but you know, we're down 40 officers. Safety and security is our primary focus. Um, we've, we have some posts currently that have one officer watching over 40 individuals. You know, there has been talk of, uh, you know, some talk show host saying that the Guam Police Department is providing chauffeur service and, and so forth. And, but you know, the reality is, is without the assistance of the Guam Police Department in the last few weeks, our officers were working a five and two shift. That means five days on, two days off, 12 hour shifts. They only had two hours off to take time off, to spend time with their family, to recuperate. But because we're also down 40 officers, these officers were recalled on their RDOs because an officer showed up cold and sick or there's military duty or for some other reason, uh, an officer on duty couldn't show up. So there are situations where an officer is working six days and taking one day off. So with the help of the Guam Police Department and we realize uh, the risk involved, their training is very different from the training our officers receive. Uh, we were able to put them in situations such as uh, transport in the visitor center um, and in the perimeter so that we can move our officers in. Officers that were trained to uh, watch uh, prisoners, uh, inmates, and detainees. And uh, we also needed to ensure their safety of the Guam police officers. We all know that Every individual within DOC was arrested by a man in blue, and we respect that. So that was one of the reasons why, uh, as a precaution, we, we situated these officers in areas where their safety would not be jeopardized, and we were able then to move our officers in. Currently, we're on uh, minimum um, uh, man manning, but we were able to shift from a five and two to a four and three. That's four days on, three days off, 12 hour shifts. Uh, this gives a lot of relief to our officers. It now gives them three days to recuperate from four days of 12 hour shifts. And, and so this assistance uh, with the Guam Police Department, we want to thank them for helping us out and we hope that we can uh, continue to, uh, to get their assistance. You know, we realize the um, the importance of the being out on the street, but we also have to realize the importance of the correctional officer and the work they do. Their job is there to protect the community of individuals who have been convicted of dangerous crimes. And it is, is equally important to ensure that our staff, our, our officers at DOC and our staff, our civilian staff, 
are properly manned to ensure the safety of not only our staff, but for those that we watch over. And so, uh, you know, we don't take it lightly. We, we, uh, we respect and, and we thank our officers, uh, that, the Guam police officers that assisted us in the last few weeks, and, and we hope that they, they continue to at least stay with us so that it can relieve some of the stress our officers, officers currently face. Um, again, like I stated, uh, you know, our facility is old. Uh, recently, um, we made some renovations. Uh, for those of you who have been to DOC, the domes, which were originally built by the federal government for the purposes of housing the Chinese immigrants that were coming uh, to Guam in the late 1900s and early 2000s, uh, those skins were finally changed and completed uh, two weeks ago. So uh, at the cost of uh, almost $400,000 through a federal grant, we were able to change the skins on the domes. Uh, again, currently in the domes, we have about 120, 130 detainees housed in three domes. One dome is, is currently uh, vacated. We use that for storage. Um, Again, thanks to the consent decree, uh, GMH, our relationship with GMH uh, has worked wonders to service the needs of our inmates and detainees. Uh, our policy at DOC is that within your first 14 days at DOC, you will get a, a complete medical check and psychological evaluation within those 14 days. As a result of GMH being there, we're able to have medical care there on a constant basis. Uh, the clinic hours are until about 5, 6 in the evening, but we have nurse, a staff nurse on board until about 11, 11.30 in the evening. Any emergencies after that? We also have on-call doctors, so if there's a situation that arises after 11, we call the on-call doctor, and then from that point, they give us a recommendation either to bring to GMH or... Uh, the individual can wait until the doctor arrives in the morning. Um, again, like I said, as a result of the consent degree, post 17, post 7, and post 8, housing will have locking mechanisms and cameras, and, and 6, excuse me. Um, we've also, in the past, uh, amazingly enough, DOC has not had operational security cameras since after Typhoon, which Typhoon was that? Paca, Typhoon Paca. Uh, as a result of that, through uh, federal grants, we've been able, Hagatnya has interior and exterior cameras. We're gonna be adding a few more. Um, Mangilo, on exterior cameras, we have about 70% of the exterior covered. We have probably about 40% of the interior covered. <clears throat> We have federal funding that will eventually, uh, we'll be installing perimeter cameras in the next few months, and we will be totally 100% uh, video camera capable of our perimeter at DOC. Uh, again, we will be working to see what we can do to get perimeter cameras indoors in all the units. Um, we're also, you know, we're. People say, well, we're in the media a lot, and the reality is, is what has happened is, you know, there's a culture within DOC, uh, and this has been going on for many years. And so, in the, in the past, a lot of the investigations, contra the findings of contraband, uh, minor assaults in prisons, were handled internally by the IA. And we have our DHB, Disciplinary Hearing Board, which, which uh, passes on punishment to these individuals. Uh, we have since changed that way of thinking. So all contraband, regardless how large or small, we report it to the Guam Police Department, the Mandania Task Force, and we ask for their assistance in, in uh, finding leads to how that contraband got in or who brought the contraband in. Um, we're, we're seeing great results, uh, as, as you're well aware. There are individuals at DOC, regardless of them being incarcerated, are still conducting their drug business inside DOC. By finding uh, cell phones, 
the Guam Police Department has been successful in, uh, in, in, in mining data from the SIM cards and making arrests. So as we work with them, you know, you'll see more, you know, every, every time you find even a one can of snuff that was thrown in, that's going to be reported to the Guam Police Department. And of course, the media picks it up and, and uh, reports it in the news. In the past, this was done all internally. Uh, likewise with all assaults. If an inmate is punched by another inmate, we have them arrested by GPD, and we have them booked and reconfined at DOC. And then they also go through the DHB at uh, the Department of Corrections. So what, what seems like uh, a grow, growth in, in assaults or growth in contraband is really our effort to be more transparent by allowing outside entities to come in, work with us, so that we can get down to the brass tacks of what's, who's bringing that in and how we can best stop that contraband. Um, as a result of that, we work very closely with the, uh, with the canine units from the Customs and Quarantine. They come on a regular basis and they do sweeps of the Department of Corrections. We just launched the program and uh, that hopefully will be starting in the next few weeks where they'll actually be training four of our officers to handle their canine uh, uh, dogs so that when they're short of manpower, our staff who are trained by them can actually pick the dogs up and take them to DOC to do uh, 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 drug sweeps. So, you know, these are some of the things that, you know, we're currently trying to do. Uh, we do daily... Uh, we do daily shakedowns. Those have been proving very successful. Uh, there are weeks at a time where we find no contraband, but you know the reality is, is we run a prison. We still get throw-ins. Even, even with GPD watching the perimeter, we've still had what, a couple of throw-ins since they've been watching. Uh, because we don't have individuals posted at each individual place. Inmates watch us. They know exactly our moves. You know, we try to move it around, but the reality is, is they're there 24-7, and they watch how we operate. And so, you know, it's, it's a constant battle, but, you know, with the dedication of our officers and, and the techniques that we're putting together and the procedures that we put in place, uh, we're showing a, a major decrease in contraband. Uh, we have applied for, uh, for some... Uh, Department of Interior grants to strengthen our fence line. Uh, as you're all aware, aware, a community, our prison is built within a community. Uh, if there was an escape within 20 yards, an inmate is in the jungle. An inmate is in a housing area. Um, also, in so far as throwing in contraband, uh, for those of you who have gone by there, there are very weak points where contraband can easily be thrown in. And, and so the grant that we're, we've applied for was to harden our weak points within, in, within those areas and also to bring in our own canine units. Uh, so these are the things that we're, we're looking at. And we're also looking at uh, some electronic devices for, for detection of contraband as visitors come in. So as we, as we move forward, and, and understandably, you know, we need a new facility. I mean, that's the reality. But, you know, even in the United States, prisons are probably one of the last things that policymakers want to build. Everyone, you know, wants to build schools and hospitals and, and other public facilities. And, and a prison is, is an area where everyone feels that you lock them up, throw the keys away. But you know, the reality is, is the Department of Corrections recidivism, recidivism rate is 62%. Thanks to uh, um, Teresa Tayama and her staff and, and the various programs that uh, we're trying to implement to try to rehabilitate these individuals so that they have a skill when they leave the Department of Corrections. Last Saturday, we had the Funa Rising, which is a, a group of women, thanks to uh, the deputy director and the first lady, 
Uh, we had a workshop last Saturday where we brought in women who are in the construction field to do workshops for our female inmates and detainees. Uh, this is, has been the second, the second time we've done that. Um, we are currently doing a program with uh, the Department of Public Works and these individuals uh, were working very closely with the Guam Trades Academy and the Department of Labor underserved program where we're training six individuals, four, four male inmates, one female inmate, and one parolee uh, to be backhoe operators, to be certified backhoe operators. The classroom classes are currently ongoing on Saturdays at DOC, and uh, once those are completed, they'll go actually out into the community with the Department of Public Works, and part of their training is to hands-on training using the backhoes to help clear the ponding basins around the island. And that will add on uh, certification to them, and then once they've completed that training, they'll be certified back operators. So we're working with a, a nonprofit organization, uh, Carlos Camacho, who has a program similar to that of the Habitat for Humanities. And we're going to uh, be engaging him to assist 30 parolees to learn the construction fields so that these individuals who are now out on the street have a skill so that they don't come back to DOC. We don't want them to come back to DOC. So at the Department of Corrections, you know, we, we look at the holistic approach. We don't look at just confining these individuals. We also look at trying to find ways to rehabilitate them as well. Uh, but, you know, time, times are tough. Uh, you know, our, our budget, I know on the realignment budget, when, when the governor asked us to submit where we can make cuts to the Department of Corrections, I wrote uh, an email saying we have nothing to cut. We are bare bones, it is, it is. And, and uh, we originally asked for 29,000, our budget was cut to 26. The additional $3 million that we requested for was primarily to cover the Guam Memorial Hospital. Uh, the, I saw the governor's realignment uh, budget. It was shown to me uh, over the weekend. And DOC will, will not receive any cuts from the $26 million. But, you know, we're, we're still short on the $3 million for the hospital. Hopefully we can work with the administration on trying to secure that funding. But other than that, you know, I, I, it's been a pleasure working with, uh, you know, the fine men and women at DOC. I, I, Every day, every day, the dedication that these individuals uh, have to deal with, with what little resources they have, and to ensure the safety of not only themselves, but for those who are housed at DOC. So if there's any questions, Senator, I'll be glad to ask them. Thank you, Director. I'd also like to also thank the Department of Corrections officers for the hard work that they do. Um, I'd like to, at this time, open any questions up to the panel speaker. Uh, Mr. Director, let me start with your last comment sure. about the hospital. Um, if memory serves me right, maybe your ASO can correct me. Um, if you have one here. Oh, she, did, she couldn't make it. Okay. Did we, wasn't there a specific line for the hospital uh, well, appropriation? There was, there but was. What, what happened was is the, when the budget, because we included $26 million, or 29 million, excuse me, and that included the hospital. And when it was cut down to 26, it left only 650,000 for medical care. We've paid that bill, by the way. So we've paid 650 already to the Guamari Hospital for, for, for FY18. There, there wasn't a separate line? I thought there was a 1.7 appropriation for, mm -hmm. I can get my staff to find it. But let me get to another point and, and let somebody else, uh, I'll go get it so that I can show that I, we had a specific appropriation to the hospital. I mean, for, for, for hospital costs. Um, Madam Chair, if you could, the one thing that I was concerned about that the, the director kept mentioning was he short 40 personnel is that correct? Right. We've lost 40 officers, correct. You've lost 40 officers. Um, again, memory may, at my age, my memory may be going, but I thought that 
DOC, like GPD and GFT, was given a specific recruitment uh, um, appropriation several years ago. And I know for a while, though, you were doing fairly well in, in getting graduating classes with new personnel. Right. Um, can um, you or the deputy submit to the chair or directly to me, either way or both, a, uh, a detailed description of how the recruitment money was used, how many people were picked up, how many new uh, 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 DOC officers you have now as a result of, of that? Because if I remember correctly, your, your department was the only one that was near successful in that one, in that you yeah. hired... 36. Yeah, I was thinking it was almost 40, right. but still, that's more than the 16 right. that right. GPD did. So if you can give me a, a detailed explanation of how that $1.2 million was allotted and used, and what happened to that, and where it's at right now, and and then I'll, I have a separate question that needs to be asked. Okay. With, a, with, the, with the loss of these 40, what's happened to the appropriation for those 40 personnel? One would think okay. that with, so, the, the with, the, with them being senior members of your, your department, that the appropriation for them would be enough to pick up two corrections officers' right. ones as opposed to a 30-year veteran uh, uh, correction officer three or four. Right. Let, let me answer the first question, Speaker. Uh, so the, the vacancy pool, which you were alluding to, we actually exhausted that. That's where we were able to bring in 36 new officers. And then we also recruited, I think, six or yeah, seven more. 18, uh, seven. And then we so we, we exhausted the vacancy pool. But, but since we brought those officers on board, we've actually lost 40 more. Being, being a corrections officer is, is not easy work. You know, it, it's, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure involved. I mean, the constant threats. I had one officer last week come in and, and submit his resignation and, and saddens me because he was part of that 36. And he was only on board for, what, less than two years. And, and he just, he just couldn't handle the threats anymore. When he'd come to work and, and inmates would threaten him and his family, uh, he just couldn't, you know, face or uh, ensure the safety of his family on a daily basis. I mean, some of these threats may, may be idle threats, but you, you don't know if they're real threats. Uh, as I said, a lot of these guys, although they're incarcerated at DOC, still operate a drug business outside the fence. And... and you know, that's why the, the onion for us is priority one. And, you know, I would prefer to bring in additional officers now than, than you know, but I'd hate to see the clinic closed because then do we put ourselves back again into the federal courts? So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm playing with that balancing act. So, you know, I'm trying to work with the budget folks. Since the governor has... Uh, Status quo, our budget at $26 million. I'm going to try to work with them and see what we can do and maybe even try to leverage some of that 2% sales tax that you pass for the hospital or we can offset some of that so we can, uh, you know, try to avoid, you know, not avoid, but using some of that to cover our, to offset some of our $3.3 .3 million that we pay the hospital every year. So, I mean, we're trying to work it out, but I really need, you know, to get more officers on board. Uh, but, you know, again, the recruitment process, by the time you train them, a year is going to go by. And so that's why, you know, I, I really appreciate the help the Guam Police Department is, is giving to us. Uh, I know there's, like I said, there's people out there that were using these, these police officers and to be chauffeurs or to take care of visitors, but, you know, they serve a critical job. No, I, I understand. I, I'm going to go try to find that uh, appropriation for the hospital. Sure. Okay. The um, 
Well, first of all, about GMH operating the, the clinic. Right. I thought I heard in a news media what, a couple of weeks ago, I think, that they were going to drop DOC. I, you know, I spoke to Peter John, um, the administrator of um, the hospital, and, and primarily what it was was he gave the, the board, the Guamara Hospital board, I think four or five options on way to cut expenses. And so GMH-DOC uh, relationship was one of those options. It wasn't on the chopping block. It was one of the options that they were looking at as possible ways of cutting their expenditures. All right. uh, this issue of uh, deporting um, inmates that are, I guess, meet the criteria. Right. Um, is, there, is there a number of them that's being looked at? You know, uh, we work very closely with, the, with ICE. Uh, they're the ones who actually put the detainers on these individuals. Um, so, you know, we constantly check how many individuals. There's currently anywhere from 25 to 30 people with ICE detainers. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that, that um, they're ready for deportation. Uh, it could be an individual, for example, and, and again, in order to be deportable is you had to have committed a deport deportable crime. So once ICE s finds that you committed a deportable crime, they put a detainer on you. Now that individual could have only served six months of, of a 10-year sentence when they got that detainer. So, you know, the, the, the committee doesn't look at them as someone viable. Usually it's someone who served a good majority of their time and then also individuals whose victims agree to them being deported. I know that the, the victims are contacted. If the, contacted, if the victim agrees that this individual should be deported, uh, then the governor commutes their sentence. Once the governor commutes their sentence, we then transport them to Hagatnya, to the federal detention facility, and we actually start charging the, the federal government for their for their incarceration moving forward. Okay. Is, is Medicare um, benefits, are they eligible for that, for those who are of age? No, you know, and, and um, that's one question, uh, Senator, that we were actually looking at, was, was detainees, uh, detainees who, current, who may have health insurance, uh, you know, what are the possibilities, for example, if we had a detainee whose spouse has a job and insures the husband, the husband gets arrested, he's detained at the Department of Corrections for a month, you know, you know, is there a possibility where we can actually bill their health provider for medical services they receive? Now, once they're adjudicated, once they're convicted, then they become wards of, of the Department of Corrections and we cover them completely. But you know, when, when, when they're a detainee, when they're arrested, they're booked and confined, waiting arraignment, you know, we're looking at the possibility of can insurance companies or even Medicare or MIP still cover them because the, in essence, they're not, they're, they haven't been adjudicated. They haven't been convicted. So we're, we're looking into that as a, as a possibility. Okay. Um... The, you say that you still get a number of incidents of, uh, I guess, contrabands being thrown over the fence. Right. Um, is the fact that that Mai Mai Road is, I mean, is that basically the that access that facilitates that? It, it's tough, uh, Senator. You know, and especially on the backside, that's a private road, and that's access to uh, uh, houses in in the area. And uh, Warden, well, I want to let the Warden explain. He's uh, he can explain much better in regards to I, how... I, I guess I was thinking about the practicality of cutting off uh, my, my road. All right, Senator. That was brought up by the uh, Lieutenant Governor in one of my conversations. And, um, yeah, that would be the, uh, ideally the, the right thing to do is just cut off that, that, uh, that vein that feeds the north. But then you're going to have people, residents from uh, my, my road making, uh, you know, a standoff on it. You know, folks that I have a cousin that just lives right out the uh, perimeter, works at Anderson. Could you imagine we cut off that road? It's going to have to go all the way around. So, again, that's that's up to the to the governor, the lawmakers. But 
Our prison is in the middle of the island, and I shared this with um, Senator Nelson. We have, my, my, we have a main road running right by our facility within a foot from our fence line, even less. All it takes is someone, and I hope no one's uh, really watching this, but to drop off uh, another individual, run into the, the dense uh, uh, jungle, wait for it to, to clear, run across the street, and throw it over the fence. And it's unfortunate we don't have the manpower to, to man those, those posts out there in the perimeter. We do have GPD out there, uh, uh, in, uh, out there in the perimeter, but just yesterday we had an air melt. We had someone throw over the fence. We got the license plate, so we're, of course, looking into that matter. But it's, it's, when you have that and you have a uh, private uh, eastman servicing the uh, private residence there in the rear, and I don't have an officer back there, it's too easy to breach our security. Okay. I mean, we've learned to, to work within our, our environment. It's unfortunate, like I said, uh, the prison is just like the, uh, the uh, public dump site. No one wants one in, in their backyard. It's an eyesore. The old adage, lock them up and throw away their key, that, that includes us as well. So we're not really getting the, uh, I mean, I've been there 32 years, still the same old thing, shortage of manpower. So we're here before you to ask for this uh, assistance in getting us the manpower. Yes, FY17, we received 36 officers. But as they go along, I, I got an 18-year-old coming right out of high school. Imagine that. Never held a supervisor position. But once he graduates from the training academy, goes out onto the floor, he becomes immediately a supervisor of people that don't want to be there. And when we had that 36 officers, we were on a five and two schedule. Okay. But if we would have plugged those 36 officers into that five and two schedule, we would have like four officers on the post. Everyone would want to come into work. But because of the overtime issue, it's always in any uh, prison facility, there's always this, this, this tug of war between the frontline officers and management about controlling overtime. So when we had that 36 officers on board, we had to go on an eight-hour shift to appease the, you know, the front office about controlling overtime. So, so with that said, we had to spread them out thin to control overtime. Just like now, we got the GP officers augmenting. It, it dwindled down to, what, 28? now because uh, they put some out but when they came on board we were five on two but when they came on board again because of the budget we had to spread them out thin again the line officers had to go four and three now so the odds are, are, are again hats off to the uh, men and women there in corrections but the reality is is that many times there's only one or two officers managing a unit of 60 prisoners and, and we're, we're doing our best, our best to, to keep the, the, the ship afloat. And again, I, we, I ask that, uh, you know, all this aside, I, I'm actually begging for you folks to uh, assist us in getting the uh, personnel and the funding. I mean, yeah, but, uh, I mean, my leadership here gets uh, ridiculed about they don't have management uh, or no knowledge of correction. That's not their job. Their job is to go and prostitute themselves and get us funding and personnel. My job is to enlighten them, but I can't do it if I don't have the man part to begin with. And again, the retention weight is just ridiculous. When I have, like I said, an 18-year-old coming in, not holding a supervisory job, and then be placed in a situation to supervise lifers, too easy for that, that individual to say, I'm done with this line of work. Because I'm not assuring him that mere, you know, substance just to, to feel safe by providing him another ulcer. I don't have that. We don't have that. We need 67 officers to run uh, uh, both Agonia and the Department of Corrections daily. 67. On an average, we have half of that, less than half of that running a shift. I hope that gives you an idea of the numbers. It does. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Mr. Speaker, just to clarify, it's, it's in miscellaneous, miscellaneous provision section 19, 19B3. It appropriates 2 million but uh, the 1.5 only if the revenue projections meet or meets expectations. So for the second quarter, so we haven't gotten the in regards of meeting the expectations to receive that 1.5. Okay, um, I'm just looking at the, I know you and I have had our Differences with the CRER, your favorite uh, report. And I, I believe we sent you a report. Yes, from you correct. It, but it takes so long 
but right now, as of February the 28th, your DOC is showing 1.7 in encumbrances. Do you know what those encumbrances are that haven't been paid? It's, it's probably uh, GMH. A good majority is GMH. Because although we've paid the 650, you know, we, we have not yet paid them anything else since then. And then we also have our food vendor. Those are our two primary major expenses, is our food vendor and our, our food services and, and uh, GMH. And we've only paid the first quarter f for GMH. Do you know how long this encumbrance has been on the books and is still outstanding, either one of you? You know, we, we do, um, Mr. Speaker, you know, we've actually been pretty good in paying prior year obligations. Uh, and, and, but, you know, this year the budget didn't include us to pay prior well, no, year. I'm not talking about prior year. This is, this is an encumbrance as a result of this year's appropriation in right. the CRER. Okay, so, so it's, it's more than likely GMH, uh, our food vendors. I know that we're about a, a couple months behind on our food vendor. We're processing that now. That's, actually, that's been processed. We're just waiting for, for payment on that one. Because I, I was just looking at the list of encumbrances and DOCs. That's a, that's a fairly large and then, of course, overtime, Mr. Speaker, uh, because of the loss of 40 officers, our overtime has spiked as well. So. Okay, well, well, maybe if you can get, break, get me a report on what this 1.7 okay. was and how long it's been outstanding, because I just don't understand uh, why you uh, guys would have that, that large and outstanding in your uh, encumbrance listing in CRER. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director, I, I do have a question. Do, have you worked with the um, with Chief, Chief Justice Merriman because some of the um, cuts that they were going to do was the electronic monitoring and I think that really would have benefited you. It would have saved four million dollars uh, for DOC that you could possibly have utilized. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Senator, one, one of the things that that we've been working with, with the courts. One was, is the ORAS, the Ohio Risk Assessment. And, and the, the whole intent was, you know, to cut down the detainee population. I mean, our detainee population is 50% of our overall population. If, if we can cut our detainee population in half, I mean, uh, you know, the stress on manpower w won't it be as bad. The, the problem with the ORAS, it, it's a paradigm shift, you know. Uh, our judges aren't ready to jump in and, and release people, and neither is the, the AGs. So, you know, it, it's going to take some time uh, to actually, you know, let that sink in and actually, you know, start to operate. Uh, our, our, case work, our case workers have already all been trained in the ORS, likewise with, with the courts. So we're ready to go as soon as it starts to kick in and judges and the AGs start beginning to release individuals rather than confining them, you know, that'd be great. And just a point of information, the Chief Justice has already notified me that she has decided not to move forward with the, with the, the electronic, no, with the electronic yeah. bracelet. And, and that would have helped Because of the us. fact that the, 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 uh, uh, the cash crunch, yeah. though in the governor's um, fiscal realignment plan, he has left in the the electronic monitoring yeah. appropriation with a with a fifty thousand dollar reduction. So I, yeah. I'm going to be writing back to the chief justice and say that that was a separate special appropriation, not part of your, not part of your um, uh, lump sum, and this was specific to try to address this issue yes. of reducing your population. And and that would greatly help us if if we have the electronic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, devices. Uh, uh, I mean, if we could get a hundred detainees out of DOC, I mean, that pretty much you know cuts down the Hagatnia on the local side. So you know that would greatly assist us uh, not only in finances but also so I'll work in with around that. As a matter of fact, it's one one of the items on our list. So. Uh, 
Well, some of the things that we're looking at as possibly saving money is, uh, amazingly enough, you know, the, the, the transport of, of the detainees to and from DOC to the courts. Uh, if, if DOC can pass that responsibility over the courts and have the marshals transport, that would really free up a lot of our resources. Um, we need legislation that uh, will allow the Department of Corrections to establish a commissary. We also, uh, we're in the process of uh, writing legislation, but we need, Senator, if we can get your assistance from your bill writers, to, to create the Correctional Officers Reserve Program, or the CORE is what we call it. Uh, this will assist us in moving our uniform officers into the facility and allowing our reserve officers to man uh, transport, to man the visitor center, do perimeter checks at a lower cost to the government of Guam. So, you know, uh, we have the basis of the legislation. We're patterning it after the, uh, the courts marshals the reserve program. And we're, what we're going to be doing is so that we can, we can move this program quickly we're going to include in the legislation the actual rules and procedures so that we don't have to go through the AAA process, but allow us uh, to address any future changes to go through the AAA process. So, Senator, if we can work with your bill writers to assist us, you know, that'd be great for us. You know, if we can bring in 20 individuals in a reserve program will greatly assist us in our manpower issues. Uh, we also have the electronic monitoring devices. Um, we're also looking at a commute to uh, parole program. Commute individuals, uh, and Senator will, uh, will need again legislation for this. In, uh, inmates who uh, have shown to be, um, have no issues within the Department of Corrections, individuals who have less than a year to serve and have gone through various programs within DOC. Uh, they will go through a committee, be vetted, and possibly go through uh, a commutation to parole. So basically, although they're commuted, they will report to parole. If they violate the, their parole conditions, then they'll be brought back to DOC. But this will greatly assist us in also reducing the prison population as well. Um, again, we talked about the medical insurance, uh, Senator, that you brought up. If, if we can uh, get, if they're on MIP, Medicare, or private insurance uh, during that 14-day period when they go through a full medical checkup, if, if their insurance company can cover that cost because they're not adjudicated yet, they're still a detainee, you know, if we can work that out. I don't know if it requires legislation. Or, or whatever, but it's something that, that uh, obviously will reduce our medical care costs as well. I just have a question for the, um, the, the bill that you're asking assistance in developing a, uh, a commuted sentencing within the year. Has this been vetted through perhaps the judiciary? Because no, I, well, you know, actually it's, it's something that we've been, uh, Tossing around with uh, parole, okay. uh, you know, again, the, these are individuals, uh, and you know, what we want to do is, is so the parole try to get a bill written so we can show it. You know, it's kind of hard to show something, and, but you know, we'll show it to the stakeholders. And, and again, these are individuals who have already been convicted and serving time. Yeah. So if, if I was serving five years, and I have one year left, and during my four years at DOC, I've been a model prisoner. I've followed the programs. I, I have not been disciplined for any reason. And, I, you know, I'm a good candidate for early release. Mm -hmm. Actually, we're not calling it early release. We're calling it uh, a, a commutation. So you, we actually commute the one year, and then, but they still have to report to parole. Okay, so it's not like they're completely out. They still have to report to parole on a monthly basis. So I think that... We need to sit down with the sure. judiciary and talk in sure. depth about some of the... I need to talk to the front office, too, because they haven't heard about this either. So, <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, 
th these are things with, with, with our, our team of, of subject matter experts. You know, we're, we're trying on a constant basis on how we can rehabilitate, how we can best, uh, you know, provide the best security uh, program, the best medical, the best forensic, you know, psychiatric care if possible at DOC. Okay. Is there any more questions, Speaker? Okay. Well, Director, I'd like to thank you for your time and thank, thank, thank you very much, Senator. The team and Department of Correction officers for coming, uh, even especially the social work. Uh, we will continue to meet, um, and perhaps we can meet with some of your officers to discuss the bills that you'd like sure. us to assist you with. Um, I do see that there is a possibility that we can move really quick on the correctional officers program, and then also uh, with speakers' help to ensure that the electronic monitoring does become effective yeah. um, since the appropriation is there. That, that will help tremendously, Speaker, if we can get that electronic devices yes. on. And we'll get you uh, the list of, uh, of, of uh, actuals uh, for the 1.7 million. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. And, thank uh, you, Senator. We'll have a constant communication with whatever assistance we can provide as far as policy making. Okay. This thank you very much. Thank you. The Committee on Housing, Utilities, and Public Safety has now called these informational hearings adjourned. It is now 4.45 p.m. Have a good day. God bless.